Good morning. I'm Neil Kleiman, representing interventional cardiology here at the Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. And uh, it's my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce our guest Grand Rounds lecturer for today, Dr. Roxana Maron. And uh, as I said this morning, it's very challenging to introduce someone who, in fact, needs no introduction. But uh, I'd love to introduce Dr. Marin to you. You probably know her achievements very well. Roxana, it's absolutely wonderful to have you here with us this morning. Thank you, Dr. Kleiman. It's wonderful to be here. We, we had a very spirited discussion at dinner last night. We'll visit a little bit of that. You gave a superb grand rounds. Thank you. Uh, I think we're all exceptionally grateful to you. So let's start by asking some uh, questions. You gave grand rounds about dual antiplatelet therapy, combination with antithrombotic therapy, and you mentioned a number of trials, actually you mentioned a large number of trials, many of which you've become principal investigator for and study lead. Tell me how that evolved in your career, or perhaps, to put it better, how your career evolved to the point where you could do that, and perhaps for some of our younger listeners, uh, who are even younger than you, if that's possible, uh, how can they rise to, to such positions? So first of all, thank you for that. Uh, I think I've been very, very fortunate uh, to have had these opportunities and to have chosen interventional cardiology as my as the uh, subspecialty that I'm most passionate about and I would say that I think all of for all of the success that has come there have been a lot of failures too and I think uh, the the road to success is always met with failures and that is how you can succeed even better because you you learn from your mistakes and um, I would say that for the young listeners, a lot younger than me, that uh, this is a, uh, a tough road, especially for women, but a road that could be very well traveled by women and should be traveled by women. And I believe wholeheartedly that if one follows their passion and they work hard and put a lot of effort into what it is that they're most passionate about, which then doesn't become work, it becomes really a hobby, then you become successful. But you do have those occasions of failures, which I'm most proud of because that's how I've learned to, to then progress. So tell us, uh, if you would, about a failure and how it got you to redirect your course and made you better. Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, in any in anything that we do. I mean, I think one of the things was that I tried to do it all and uh, found that it was very, very difficult. And sometimes I often think, have I failed at being an exceptional mother, for example, or an exceptional researcher, or an exceptional interventional cardiologist? And I learned that I think what you need to do is to do what you can do at the best possible a, an available energy level that you have for the best quality of the work that you can do. So there was a time where I was really uh, very much focused in making sure that I did every procedure, that I learned everything, and then I was also involved in multitudes of clinical trials and multitudes of meetings, etc. And I found myself um, very much uh, thinking that I wasn't really progressing, but rather diffusing myself. And so in many ways, I uh, began to really see where, I, where my talents were, were best fitted for. And I think in that way, I was able to channel all of that energy into the areas that I think are important. And for me, it's always been about the patients. It's not really about the new device or the new drug or the new thing but rather how can we enhance the lives of the patients better? Uh, what are they needing and how can we uh, get to those needs? And, and that is why a lot of my work, if you look at my history as you talked about today, is about uh, things that are not usually studied like risk scores and understanding better about acute kidney injury and stent restenosis and stent thrombosis and bleeding. And those kinds of things are usually not part of the 
um, you know, a new device or a new drug, yet they're endpoints, but they're not really about the patient so much. And so I've always focused in that direction, and I continue, I hope to continue in that way. So in medicine, that, that really translates into scholarship. How do you take what information we have, uh, determine what information we need, how do you put that together, how do you make the next step? And it's very clear you've been an inspiration uh, to all of us in that regard. But you said something very interesting um, when I asked how you got to be such a leader, uh, in particular in the field of clinical trials, uh, you said that that's a great aspiration for women. It's a great aspiration for men, too, and uh, whether the viewers of this segment are women or men, uh, you're someone to look up to, regardless of what their gender or sex is. So I know you've been passionate about the role of women in interventional cardiology. Uh, that's always a difficult topic to assess. Let me turn the topic around a little bit. What advice do you have for men who want to further the career of women in our field? So I have great news for men in interventional Good, cardiology. we need some. Yeah, first of all, I think uh, the men um, in my life uh, and my mentors were almost all men. And I would say that uh, you all play, especially those men who have been, who are in leadership positions, have an incredible, incredible opportunity to mentor women and to give them the opportunities for excelling and promoting them into leadership positions. Only those who are worthy, of course, those who work hard, those who should be in those positions and seeking talent and, and really um, you know, feeding into that talent and progressing that. So I think there's no question that um, men could have a very, very important role. They have done in my life. I wouldn't be where I am without my male mentors. And uh, by the same token, I believe that women can also play a, a really great role in mentorship. Unfortunately, there aren't many women in leading leadership positions in interventional cardiology. We're trying to get there, but until then, this is the great opportunity for you guys to play up and come up and help uh, women and seek the talent uh, that you see in your group, in your female uh, trainees, and, and feed that talent. But tell us how we should do that. So I, I think one of the problems, uh, and it's not just an interventional cardiology issue, it's a social issue. Uh, you know, I, I think everyone's a little uncertain as to what the role of women ought to be, um, and is a little uncertain as to how they ought to take a big step forward in promoting women and getting us to the point of sex equality or perhaps sex so, equivalence. So I think the first step is to be gender neutral, actually, to not to think about someone because of their gender, but rather because of their talents, and then be gender neutral. And I keep talking about uh, my mentor, uh, Marty Leon, who um, is incredibly gender neutral. So Marty, I hope honest. you're listening. <laughs> I have to tell you, uh, he uh, would see my strengths, but also my weaknesses. But he was there to harness my weaknesses and promote my strengths. And he was there behind me on stage, brought me up to the stage, stood there behind me, but very quietly walked off the stage when he felt that I was ready for the stage. And I mean that in a, um, in a funny term, I mean not literally, but you know, but really exactly what he did. And that to me, he's the quintessential mentor who's always seen the strengths and weaknesses. And he would very much so see the weaknesses but in a very quiet, gentle manner, uh, reduce those by promoting the strengths and to, to overcome the weaknesses. And I think that's what most mentors should do. And of course, mentorship is a bilateral relationship. And I think one of the things that we forget about, we talk about mentorship, oh, let's be mentors. Well, if the mentee is not giving back, then that mentor 
will lose their um, you know, enthusiasm and the, and the love for mentorship and will move on or not give back. And so I think it really does have to be both, uh, both sided. So let's ask some other tough questions. Oh, sure. You've listed Marty as one of your mentors and I, I happen to know who your other mentors have been. And these are all exceptional individuals. Uh, there are very few people like them in the world. Now, did you choose them as mentors or did you just happen to fall under their guidance? And if so, how did you choose them? Yeah, so I was very, very lucky. I mean, I didn't, I didn't choose Greg Stone, but he definitely has played a very, very important role in my growth and development and he's been a mentor as well. I've learned so much from his incredible work ethic and his brilliance uh, in clinical trials and design, et cetera. Um, Marty Leon, I did seek out, and, uh, and I think that as a, as a young trainee, if you know what your passion is, look for who is the best in that area and, and follow them, and, I, and that's what I did. And so I did take a very difficult step leaving Mount Sinai um, as a graduate fellow where I was given a fantastic opportunity to stay with my colleagues at Mount Sinai to go to a much lesser position at, at the Washington Hospital Center only because I wanted to work with Marty Leon and his group because I knew there was something special about that group at that time. That was 1995. And so how lucky was I that I, I went there with no expectations but only to give my hard work and my effort and my passion and I was so lucky that he embraced but, but it and why, gave why back to me. Why is this luck? Why is this not your skill and your drive? Well because I could have been wrong, right? I could have chosen him as the, the key person to go to and he could have been not the best mentor but I was lucky that he actually was. And, and I well, would say that everyone should, should, well, I think I was a good but mentee. Maybe was, but maybe you were smart because you did the right research and took the Absolutely. right risk. Absolutely, I did, I did do the right research. I and was you took watching the right risk. that. Yes, it was a big risk. I left uh, my then uh, very, very, uh, uh, the love of my life behind and we commuted uh, uh, for two years, but, um, uh, and then we, it, it ended up in a nice marriage. But, but remember, but by Texas standards, New York and Washington are a block apart. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, no, it was pretty far on the weekends and uh, with hard work and long hours. But we, we managed, and it was, a, it was difficult. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, there's no question that um, I worked very hard. There's no question about that. So there's no easy way out. So people can't say, oh, let me just find some mentor who's just going to put me up on the stage and, and do great things. And, and I think if you talk to Marty Leon, he'd say, well, you know, you worked hard. You deserved it. You, you, every time I gave you something, you gave back uh, a, a great uh, product, and I kept giving you more, and you kept giving back more. And I think it's a give and take that needs to happen between mentor and mentee. So Roxana, what's next? Oh, there's so much to be done. I think um, there's a vision for uh, uh, women in medicine that I will pursue. Uh, I believe wholeheartedly that this needs to go beyond societies that care, but that's not their main mission. It needs to be a, a mission of, a, of an organization that I'm hoping to find. and. Uh, I'm, uh, to promote and to move forward. It will be called Women as One, and we will move forward and, and make it happen. Uh, I think the uh, future for clinical research, though it seems grim at the moment because of the high costs and all the burdening uh, efforts on physicians, we need to kind of think about simpler, more pragmatic ways to answer questions, to share data, to use electronic health records, inform, inform us of important questions. And I think that's gonna be the, the, the next step and I'm hoping to play a very important role there. And then there's always so much more. So the toughest question of all, who should watch this video? I don't know, I think, um, I'm hoping that young um, 
trainees will watch this video to say that there's great hope in interventional cardiology so you can do something with your hands, with your brain, with your might, uh, with your tolerance and test all of those important efforts. That's the subspecialty that will give you all of that and then some. Um, I think um, that uh, nurses, technologists should see that and respect women in interventional cardiology and I think they do. They have been our great, great supporters but it's good for them to also see that, that this is happening and that they could think bigger, especially if they're women. And the very young uh, women in, um, uh, in medicine or in science, that there's great possibilities and anything is possible. Well, thank you, Roxana. This has been great. And I, once again, I, I want to thank you for coming down and gracing us with your presence. Thank you, Dr. Kleiman.